Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to this TechStrong Learning Experience brought to you by Atlassian. My name is Cody, and I'm the host of TechStrong Learning, and we have an exciting panel ahead. Before we begin, I do have just a couple of housekeeping notes to, to go through. This session is being recorded, so if you miss any of our discussion, or perhaps you'd like to rewatch or share with a friend, the on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude our live session today. Now, if you look to the right side of your screen, you'll notice there are a couple of ways that you can engage with our speakers. The first of which is the chat tab. So I'd like you to go ahead and start warming that up for us right now by telling us either from where you're joining or what role you play in your organization. Now, if you have any questions for our speakers, I want you to direct those to the Q&A tab. However, if you do send them in the chat, we will get to them. Um, we do have a copy of the Pulse Meter report that we'll be reviewing today available in the handout section, so feel free to grab that. And before we close out, we are giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards, so be sure to stick around for the duration of our program. So our topic today is Accelerate Software Development Flow with Value Stream Management. I'm joined by Helen Beal, Chair of the Value Stream Management Consortium. Jeff Kais, Head of PMM Enterprise Agility at Atlassian. And kind of keeping us on the tracks today is our very own Mitch Ashley, CTO of TechStrong Group and Principal of TechStrong Research. So Helen and Jeff, thanks so much for joining us today on TechStrong Learning. Mitch, do you want to go ahead and get us going? Very happy to. Thank you so much, Cody, for kicking things off and helping everybody prepare mm -hmm. to how to use our software and engage. To that point, we love conversation with you while we're uh, discussing some of the results of the research that we're going to show with, uh, share with you today. Feel free to make comments, um, reactions, uh, things like that in the chat and, and put your questions in the Q&A section. And we'll try to fit those into the flow of our discussion, no pun intended, with value stream management. <laughs> and uh, just it, it's, it's, if the more you participate that way, the more the conversation gets directed to where you'd like to be part of that conversation. It can be a lot of fun. So please engage with us there and welcome everybody from uh, across the world where we have a very international audience today with us. As Cody mentioned, I'm joined by, I would say, colleagues and friends, folks that we've, we've known each other for a while in, in the industry, uh, Jeff and Helen. Jeff, uh, tell, why, how, why don't you just tell folks a little bit about yourself? Because you, you, you've been uh, at this for a while doing some really important work, and I'd love for folks to hear a little bit more about you and also, of course, your role at, at uh, Atlassian. You bet. I'll, I'll just give a, a quick minute that, you know, hey, look, I'm a uh, an engineer re reformed programmer that uh, got into product management and switched over to marketing. Uh, all, all the Dilbert cartoons aside uh, <laughs> about 15 years ago. Um, and what that means is I, I have experience with screwing a lot of stuff up. And uh, in that journey, really got to feel some of the pain that uh, that teams feel especially as you get into larger and larger companies of looking at flow and flow of value um, and getting the endless question of, is it done yet? You know, where is it? What's going on with it? That made me super passionate around um, really evaluating the flow of value. And that's what really it was when I was in the throes of all this and, and managing software delivery and, and adding a management layer across the various teams that I actually met Helen and, uh, you know, instant uh, friendship from there and, and a lot continued. At Atlassian, um, I had the enterprise agility product marketing team. So that is surrounded by primarily Jira line, our data mart, data warehouse combined with our platform. Uh, it, we have integrations into a platform and to uh, uh, the other uh, various Jira teams. So that's my role. Fantastic. Fantastic. Helen, you've been referenced multiple times. Great. It's your turn. Go for it. I was going to say that it's Jeff's fault that I'm here today. <laughs> <laughs> we'll hold him accountable if needed. <laughs> yeah. So it goes back to June 2019 when Jeff and I first met at DevOps Enterprise Summit when I was a DevOps consultant and struggling a little bit with a couple of um, ideas that we were working with around value stream mapping and metrics in particular. And I went on an InfoQ press pass to that conference and met Jeff to talk about BSM. It's the first time we met. And it was a, a meeting of minds. And from there, fr friendship and building the Value Stream Management Consortium um, together, which I chair um, as the organization. I'm also the um, head of the Research Value Stream there. 
So um, responsible for the state of VSM reports and love anybody that's doing any VSM research that we can draw on and incorporate. So I'm really happy to see um, you guys getting, um, getting involved as well and really excited to talk about what you've discovered today. Very cool. Well, let's let's do that. Let's kind of jump into things. So I'm part of TechStrong Research Analyst Firm that focuses on DevOps and related topics, as well as cloud native, cybersecurity, digital transformation, kind of right at the center of a lot of things that Atlassian does. And Helen being, uh, you know, one of the real leaders in DevOps and now value stream management. So it was it was a great opportunity, great fit, and we appreciate partnering with Atlassian to do some of this research. So we wanted to kind of take value stream. Uh, to a bit of the next level, kind of the, the level of where are we? What are folks doing with Value Stream? Uh, maybe where they're they're hitting their own uh, roadblocks or bottlenecks. Uh, how is it fitting into you know how they develop software? And trying to use some of that data to drive our discussion today. So I'm going to be sharing some of the results of this pulse meter. Is what the report's called. It's available in the handout section. You can download it at any time. Everybody will get an email after the webinar with a copy with that pulse meter document as well as a recording of a uh, link to the recording for this webinar so you can watch again share with friends etc so sit back and relax and we'll share the data with you here so let's do that uh, as we uh, i had a series of six questions that we kind of narrowed down and decided to focus on for our audience now these are people that are responding on sites like devops.com and container journal People that read and, and work and do do uh, you know their their vocation is in the area of creating software and, and applying value stream management. And one of the questions, first questions we really wanted to ask is why and what are the benefits? What do you anticipate getting uh, out of implementing value stream management? And there are a number of kind of options of what we presented the the people taking the survey to react to. Uh, interestingly enough. Uh, very well fit, improving flow and optimizing flow, you know, comes out on top very closely followed by, you know, improving value outcomes, which I think is, of course, another you know, obvious but very important outcome that we're, we, why we do value stream management. And then, of course, the whole topic of bottlenecks. Uh, Jeff, what's your reaction to that data? Is that consistent as you talk to enterprise and you work on agility and flow with them? Very consistent. You know, as as I talk to uh, the various companies, these questions come across in different aspects of, of you know, how, why is this taking so freaking long? Where is it getting stuck? What are the problems we're having? How do we actually uh, go to improve? One of the aspects that I love to talk about is, you know, with the billions that have been spent in, in frankly, digital transformation and any tool that gets implemented, we still can't answer the most fundamental question of, you know, are we getting better? Are we doing, you know, are we improved from where we are at? What's interesting about the results here is that most of these different answers, uh, with the exception of increased the value outcomes, are about the efficiency and effectiveness of the process itself. Um, I think the majority of people, when they look at value stream management, um, they're, they're looking at this like, well, how do I get better? How do I improve the process? When we talk about value stream management, I like to talk about this as, as look, let's evaluate and use practices from lean um, using uh, age old manufacturing kinds of concepts, lead time, cycle time, throughput kind of analysis on the process of software delivery, recognizing it's not you know, there, there's nuances to have to do with, but you need this data to be able to evaluate how well are we doing today? What is our efficiency today? And then as we make adjustments in the process to say, are we doing better? From that comes, you know, uh, what is it? 80% of the, of the answers to the kinds of things people are looking to, uh, to gather here, you know, from Hey, I want flow. And it just depends on where you where you came at this problem from. But I, I want flow metrics. Why? Well, that's what we're talking about. Lead time, cycle time. I want continuous improvement. Great. That's back to the same problem. Bottlenecks. Oh, if I have all these, I can see the bottlenecks and so forth. It's really that visibility, right? Is it about how we're doing as well as what we're doing? And is that I'm improving? Yeah, Helen, um, someone in the, one of our participants asked, what is value stream management? Maybe I should have made that assumption. Everybody here knew what it was since they're attending. Bad assumption on my part. As a head of a value stream uh, consortium, management consortium, you're the gr a great person to ask. You want to define it? Give us a working definition? 
It's a great question. And I think when we're doing this kind of research ourselves, we're very aware that people that answer a survey about value stream management probably know what it is. But yeah, you're right. People that come to a webinar about the research may not be um, so familiar. Um, so <clears throat> Jeff gave us some kind of clues to what it is. He talks about lean and things like that. So um, it has very much come out of the lean industry. In fact, people can trace its history all the way back to Venice in the 1400s, back to the Venetian arsenal. More commonly, we look at Ford in the US and Toyota in the 1950s in Japan. And what was happening is people were starting to visualize work. So they were starting to map information and materials flow. And that happened for a long time in manufacturing. And the goals you saw actually back on that slide there, a lot of them are around um, and as Jeff pointed out, four of the answers there are very closely related, elimination of waste, removal of bottlenecks and improving and optimizing flow. And then the flow metrics are all very closely connected. So what we're trying to do in value stream management is look at our work as a value stream. A value stream starts with an idea and finishes when the customer receives the idea. And it's made up of a number of different steps. Um, in our world in technology, it's a little bit different because we're talking about digital value streams, which are kind of invisible and we do things only once in them, but we might get into that in a bit more detail um, later. But the other thing that the val value stream management consortium would say, um, looking at that and in the context of the question is that um, we talk about this duality in value stream management. Part of it is about the efficiency that Jeff talked about, so the flow. Part of it's about the effectiveness in terms of customer experience and value realization, and that's that 19% in improve or increased value outcomes. Just a really quick one on the why of value stream management. One of the whys is that DevOps adoption is getting quite stalled. So if you look at the puppet state of DevOps 2021 report, you'll see the graphic that shows four years of the mid tier not really moving up into the higher level capabilities tier. And I believe part of this is to be that people find it really hard to justify investing in continuous improvement. They find it hard to say to their leaders that they want to stop doing change because they want to spend more time tackling the problems in their work streams or their value streams or their products. And actually value stream management, that, that continuous improvement, 15%, I think is one of the most critical parts of all of this. Mm -hmm. I, you, well, just to kind of tag onto that, it's it's... This idea that, you know, we're too busy to make improvement, you know, mm -hmm. that's the, the, the adage of the of the axeman that's out cutting down wood and, and, you know, no time to sharpen the saw. You think about the efficiencies that ought to be looked at to improve the process, improve the collaboration, improve the overall delivery. Um, there's goodness that comes in that. You think about the the software pipelines, for example, that, for example, I've, I've been at companies where you can't react fast enough and deliver a critical security change because that investment hasn't been made and they're still on a, a six month delivery cycle. That's never going to fly in today's world. Um, the world is different and we need to be able to react to it. And and taking an approach that's a proactive approach to software delivery where continuous improvement is embedded into the cycle is critical. You're, you, you'll, you will never make it. Another approach to value stream management is to think of it as an overlay to the agile transformation or the DevOps transformation to help manage the improvement. Um, it's not about getting everybody certified with a sticker for some label of role that they're getting done. It's about actually making improvement. Back to the point for the billions that have been spent on digital transformation, we must, we simply must evaluate this in terms that everyone can understand, which is, you know, how are we getting better? These metrics are simple. That's why they work. How long does it take to get stuff done? Like you said, Helen, from idea to getting it realized in a customer's hand. Awesome. That's a really simple question and yet kind of hard to answer. <laughs> well, I think a big differentiator too, Jeff and Helen, is these aren't just internal IT metrics, right? It's not how many how many uh, deploys did we do per week or per hour or how much code did we write. It's about what's the outcome, right? Mm -hmm. And our ability to deliver that outcome. I think that's that's the connection that we're making is not just inside the development team, but outside to the rest of the business. So we know we're delivering value or we're, and or we're getting better at delivering value and why and how through that continuous improvement. Super important. It, it was a multi-select question. So you saw they were kind of, the mm -hmm. range was like 12 to 23%, and that's why, meaning most people had three or more, selected three or more of those answers. They're looking for multiple things yeah. in their uh, value stream management journey. 
which is important, important to know, right? It isn't just so I can have metrics or just so I can remove bottlenecks. It's, it's all of those things really for many well, organizations. And, and on that, I mean, this resonates at the most fundamental level of every single level of the organization, whether you're a team lead or an executive. Hey, you want to get more efficient? Yes. There's no one that's going to, nah, I'm, I'm good, right? It's never going to happen. And so these metrics, if, you, if the better people are aligned on how long does it take to get stuff done, how much stuff do we push through the pipe, um, the more that we get aligned on this, it, it's relatable to every level of the organization, no matter what the effort we're doing. Very important. Super. Um, if you're ready, should we move on to our next question? Very good. Fantastic. So, you know, we're always thinking about let's let's take on this new initiative, right? We always organizations call them projects or initiatives, and it's sort of the next best thing we're going to work on. But there's also reasons or obstacles that we're trying to overcome, and what maybe some of those challenges are. I'm sure our audience members, participants will relate to some of these if they're on their journey, or maybe they'll recognize these as potential things they may run into. Uh, so we asked about what are the great <clears throat> challenges around integrating value stream management into your tool chain, right? Because to get data, you have to have a source of data and, and hopefully you're not doing collecting that data manually. You've automated so much of your development. So we, we looked at everything from misaligned uh, organizational responsibilities and structures to the data and the integrity of the data, two of the top issues, um, kind of not surprising around organizational structure. And I'm glad to see that data is recognized of, it's maybe trapped in tools, maybe it's hard to integrate and in getting into those tools or systems, or maybe we just have so much of it, we don't know how to use it uh, quite yet. So it was very quickly followed right behind that was DevOps tool change. Tool chain is not fully integrated. So value stream management really is a system right, of how it fits into the work, the tools, the data sources, and uh, to be able to inform and help you with that continuous improvement and the kind of metrics you want to drive to. Helen, what's, what's your reaction to uh, some of those challenges we see? Well, we've also got a question from the audience, which I think we can probably bring into my answer. The question okay. is, how is VSM different today um, from the models that we have for application development, lifecycle management and DevOps. And the first thing we can say is that I know DevOps isn't just about tools. Honestly, I'm the first person to talk about <laughs> culture and humans. But just in the context of this answer, let's focus on the DevOps tool chain aspect or the automation aspect. So traditionally, a DevOps tool chain, and actually we just ran a little bit of micro research at the consortium to try and understand what proportion of the market thinks the DevOps tool chain is the CI CD pipeline and what proportion of the market thinks it's end-to-end -end from idea to value realization, mm. also known as a value stream. Um, quite split, 80-20 on Twitter, down to 55, sort of 45 on um, our own con consortium Slack workspace, but everyone leans towards the CICD pipeline. So my point in response to the question is that most people think that the DevOps tool chain automation, the model that we have today starts at sort of code commit and finishes at production. In value stream management, from a technology or automation perspective, we're talking about ideation all the way around to customer experience and from a process perspective. So value stream management, like DevOps, isn't just about the tools. It is first and foremost a way of working, a way of organizing, and the way of, um, of, of choosing how to choose what work to do and when and who does it. That said, Value Stream Management also has a group of technologies called the Value Stream Management Platform. This gets me back to the research a little bit more because what we're actually trying to do in Value Stream Management with the technology is use that DevOps tool chain. Remember I said earlier about things being different with the digital Value Stream? We're in a renaissance. We talked about that history of Value Stream Management back in the 1950s. The first time we saw Value Stream Management written down was in the 1990s in a book called The Great Transition. Um, from James Martin. Um, but it's really since Forrester started writing about it about 2018, we've seen a big surge in the digital marketplace, which is what drove the Valley Stream Management Consortium. And underpinning that is part of what we've been doing for over a decade in DevOps. We've built DevOps tool chains. What we've effectively done is build an abstracted technological model of a value stream. If we can harness our DevOps tool chain and get that data, get it to emit that data so that we can observe it, we can then 
present it like value streams and extract value insights that are actionable that tell us about how our value stream is pre performing. And yes, to me also, not a surprise that top of the list is the misaligned organisation responsibilities or structure. And I think that's a good one for me to hand to Jeff because this is very, very close to his heart is, of course, alignment. Well, you are the enterprise agility. Uh, is at least it's in your title, Jeff. That's taken on. Yeah. Off, so. And what the, the crap does that mean? Hey, look, um, I'm a marketing guy, right? So <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you about solutions to problems and this misaligned responsibilities. Um, and and have you know, it, boy, let me go all the way back. It reminds <laughs> me of a discussion I was having with the head of a product line at a um, at a healthcare company, and I said, "How's it going on your initiatives?" And he said. Great. We have thousands of them. I just don't know which ones we're working on. Um, and it's, again, indicative of, of what so much of the world finds themselves in. Um, you know, the greatest challenges in, in integrating value streams is there are these organizational challenges, tool challenges, and all these different things to figure out what does it actually take to get something from idea to delivery. The reason why I'm in the Enterprise Agility Group which includes Jira Line is simply that you have to be able to look at um, how these um, different organizations, the teams, the groups, and the initiatives align to the actual delivery. One of the pillars we have is with value stream management. The products that we offer to help this is um, uh, an overlay product on top of the various instances of the team planning tools, whether it be Jira or Azure DevOps and so forth, and effectively then brings it all together. And in our tool set, basically, we set and align those organizational structures, the teams, if you will, and the initiatives to then gain alignment. This gives us the ability to, to really see across to say, well, what is everybody working on? How long is it taking? Um, at the end of the day, in order to um, get this data, you need to have a really rich data source of all this planning data and, and integrated data from across the tool chain in a repository that you can slice and dice. It goes beyond just getting a simple flow of, you know, it took, you know, I, <laughs> it goes beyond just knowing, hey, uh, my throughput is, you know, 2000. Awesome. Well, what's in it? Uh, you have to you have to have a little bit more ability to slice and dice and and get uh, into the details. So, um, you know, the 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 answers that I'm seeing here really are indicative of what people need. And at the end of the day, you do need to be able to have this full system where you can um, mesh through it that brings in all this data that you can have various slices and dices as you work on your continuous improvement. Um, and and get transparency into teams that, um, frankly, have been um, stuck in a corner. <laughs> it's probably the easiest way to put it. Well, that transparency hits the silos dead on, right? Whether they're organizational silos or data silos, certainly a big part of breaking down that that barrier. Yeah, it really is. You know, there's and you would think with as long as we've been doing software which is, you know, decades now. I mean, the Agile journey has been around for 25, 30 years. I, mm -hmm. I, I still remember having Alan Shalloway come out and introduce Agile and, you know, we're going to run sprints. And, and uh, it was like mind blown from writing big specs and how long ago that was. And yet we still have so many silos that we're trying to break through. At least we have, ought to be able to get the data and correlate that data together to help us on this journey. You know, I was thinking about um, tool chain. Maybe we should be talking more about pipelines and workflows and tool chains underneath, but the, really that's the the streams of work. That's where the value is being created or should be happening, right? And, and does the underlying technology uh, hinder or help that, right? Obviously, which is what a big part of what Alassians bring into the table to help you get su surpass those issues. You know, I, you know, on that point specifically, you know, part of the excitement I have of being at Atlassian, because I've been with Atlassian for about a year. Um, it is just simply that. I mean, Jira is ubiquitous. Jira is everywhere. What's really cool now about being the space that I'm in is like my message is, hey, take all those instances of Jira. We're going to show you how to pull that together into a single spot. And using that, you're going to get data that you never could answer before. You know, it's going to answer stuff you couldn't before. Things like when an executive says, hey, um, 
what kind of stuff are we working on? Or we have initiative X, how many people are working on it? Or what has progress on it? Or even down the other end for a development team that wonders why should they provide transparency to the work that they're doing? Um, you know, gosh, why am I working on this feature? There's a reason for it. And it's a reason enough to overcome some of these challenges to integrate data into, you know, from across the tool into a BS, uh, value stream management solution. This is the point, isn't it? It's like, we've got the data. One of the frustrations I think I alluded to earlier was I was doing a lot of value stream mapping with organizations, mm -hmm. which are really valuable human-centered exercise. You visually collaborate together in a space. You learn a lot about each other and each other's work. You brush up against each other the wrong way and you come out the room and you've like all got to know each other a lot better and the work. Right. You've got a plan. You've had an epiphany. The light bulbs have gone on. But it's all been opinion-driven. It's surprisingly accurate, but it is opinion-driven. And worse, when you come back as a consultant to see how your customer's done after you've had this marvellous time with them, you discover they haven't done very much because it takes a lot of effort to go back and have another look. So, And also business as usual has happened, so they haven't really had the time um, to kind of consider those continuous improvement things we were talking about them doing earlier on. Then comes along Valley Stream Management built on the DevOps tool chain that we spent 12 years learning how to do. Suddenly, we can do value stream mapping, but have it data driven. That data is coming from those tools. And so no tools aren't the answer to kind of anything. They're just an enabler. They're, a, they're something that humans use. They're no good on their own. They're only good when a human figures out what they're using them for, how to put the data in, how to get the data out, and how to make that data useful. Let's speaking of the data, let's let's dive into that a little bit more because our next question actually was about what are some of those challenges about getting that data? What's inhibit what's inhibiting your value stream management effort about <laughs> data integration? Jeff, you were gonna jump in. Did you want to oh, say Oh, I, I love this one because um, <laughs> you know, there's sort of uh, there's a few approaches like, well, how are you gonna put all that data together? Now, so some of the answers I've heard are the following, right? Uh, one, I'm gonna build it myself right? Great. And I see a bunch of companies out making these massive data lakes, continuously trying to stitch together data. Then they're using iPad solutions or various stuff to bring it together um, and, and trying to get this on their own. Two, you're going to go with a vendor. And the great thing about a vendor is they stitch their tools together really, really well, right? Hey, this is awesome. As long as you're using all my stuff, <laughs> great, right? And there's one platform, it's going to rule them all and it's all together one. Awesome. And, and it sort of leaves the rest of us out of, well, wait a minute. I'm not an organization that's unified on a single tool that does everything, nor am I looking to build this myself, but I need some way to stitch it together without doing all the heavy lifting. I need more than just, you know, an, an integrator solution. I need somewhere where I'm going to get this data warehouse and bring it all together. One of the aspects I love about where I sit is really that is the goal of Atlassian to um, bring this together into a single repository using our open tool chain, um, integrating the you know ubiquitous Jira instances or or open DevOps if you're or the Azure DevOps if you will in that world, um, but really gives you ability to um, uh, bring this data together in a world where third party and first party from an Alaskan point of view is treated the same, and and you know, that way you can start to address some of the other issues that you're going to run into, not just connectivity. Because even there, you're still going to have to normalize some of the, you know, what are the teams and make sure all the tools roll up in a proper team structure. What are the right kind of data points? How do I normalize, you know, done versus planning versus in progress building? When am I work time, not work time? Um, I, it, there's, you know, there's some there's some good issues to get into with that as well beyond everything else I just talked about. Yeah, we're pretty sure that data is a problem. I think what's interesting about this question is like all of these things are a problem. There's not, nothing really to choose between the different answers. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that we don't know is like how much people think it's a problem. At the consortium, we do think it's a problem. In fact, Steve Pereira and I. Um, also, but also both at the consortium, also co-chair the Valley Stream Management um, Interoperability Technical Committee at Oasis. And what we're trying to do there is come up with some sort of common standards. And actually this 
idea or concept for me originated from Jeff. So I'm probably going to ask him to chip in um, in a second and explain why it's important. But create a way in which vendors and consumers have some standardized fields, reference architectures, models that they can consume. So it makes all of the data questions around VSM easier. Of course, data is always going to be a problem with so much of it and, and stuff. But anyway, Jeff, talk to us about the, the data <laughs> model vision you have in mind. You know, when we, so it was really funny. Helen and I were at a, a like I said, a, a DevOps Enterprise Summit, and um, th there was a particular vendor that was kicking against value stream management, wanted to just call it Dora. And so there were some other struggles we were having along those lines. And so it was like, well, why don't we work on doing a consortium? Um, Bob Davis was, uh, had some chats there too. It was just, it was just funny going through the whole conversation. And then what came out of it is, wouldn't it be cool if as part of the consortium, we had a way that all tools could register data in the same way so that you could actually see where they fit in the process, where there's an overlay that could effectively normalize the kinds of data that were coming through to help bring this data all together. So there would be transparency into the system. And, and with that, then you could get a standardized way of measuring and correlating these metrics today. Um, you'd have an easier way of, of getting these inconsistent formats uh, normalized, if you will. Um, even to the point of saying, what if there's a public API you could just publish to? So I, anyway, there, there was all sorts of dreaming at that point, but this is where we've gotten at this point of, of understanding that, you know, there's still a lot of data problems of bringing this together. Even in the world of, of Atlassian, as we bring out Jira Align, one of the problems that our customers face is, okay, but we still have, you know, team problems that we have to help teams um, mature in. Um, they can't have, you know, widely different structures. What is a feature? Uh, some teams put features into, you know, uh, all the way down to user stories. Other teams are putting features into Epic. Some teams have, you know, structure style a la safe and, and trying to get all that to normalize together so you can look at the progress of how these things align back and then how efficient is it. Um, there's work to be done there to get the data to normalize. Um, it's worth, you know, the, the juice is worth the squeeze though, because when you can look across and say, how are we doing in initiatives? And I like how you put it, Helen, confidence base, um, uh, or opinion base. Uh, I call it confidence base versus data. It's a whole game changer to say we're, we're out of confidence based, uh, world. Let's use real data and make data based, uh, you know, data driven decision making. Mm-hmm. You know, it, when I see it, <clears throat> a chart like that with uh, so many issues around challenges around data and uh, what you're saying, Jeff, about kind of the homegrown approach, and, and I've been down that path myself before, you, you kind of approach this Rubicon you pass over of, are we in the tools business? Or are we in the insurance business? Or Correct. Manufacturing? Or the, at some point, you got to say, unless I'm really, really good at data and data lakes and solving all these data issues, I've got to have help. A homegrown solution is going to become you know, more of a weight on our back than a, a momentum to pull us forward as it gets bigger and bigger. And I think I think that's one of the reasons, you know, if you're facing some real challenges, that's the time to get with the right partner, the right company, the right approach, same philosophy or, or learn and learn from them as well. I appreciate your experiences about that, too. Well, and that, you know, not to draw too fine a point on that, but this is kind of a downturn in economic times. Popular topics aren't, let me go do some project that doesn't impact the bottom line of the business. What does is let me improve efficiency and I'm going to bring something in so my time to value is shorter. And then I'm going to be able to produce more actual value faster. I mean, compelling arguments, add some numbers behind it, whatever your you know, broad brush, let me uh, uh, back the envelope or, or rough thumbnail it, it I, there, it's compelling. Yeah, to so go slow to go fast, isn't it? It's about injecting mm -hmm. more capacity for innovation. Yeah. yeah, there's some really important points too in the in the uh, running chat we've got around visibility, Helen, that you responded to. Yeah. 
Um, one of the things we, we've been doing lately is measuring when does AI come up in the topic of a webinar or a, or a virtual event? Just so noted, it was 31 minutes, which is probably a little longer than most. <laughs> let's, let's, let's address that elephant in the room or if, if it's an elephant or not. Where does AI play into this? Obviously, there's a lot of data that could be fed into machine learning and other kinds of algorithms. But we, well, most of those issues that I saw presented aren't AI solved problems, at least not up front anyway. Just my opinion. You feel free to disagree or, or agree. Well, uh, well, I can talk to some of the things that have been discussed. I'm neither confirming nor denying product directions. I'm just uh, spout things that I have talked about. Like one of the simplest things we've uh, had conversations about is wouldn't it be cool if you could, you know, um, uh, you know, frankly, talk, uh, have AI help you produce a specific set of analytics mm -hmm. um, for a certain data set you look at for. Um, some of that's already publicly available um, and not too far of a stretch. The key is once you have the data normalized and in a format to where you can actually utilize it, dimensionalized and, and so forth, amazing things become possible. Second thing that's kind of cool is where you can use... Um, um, these machine learning kind of models to drive, you know, well, what practices have been most efficient at our company? Show me if we were to do this, what's the likely outcome of that effort on this particular pipeline? Hey, this team with their track record, um, you know, it, how well they're going to do if we invest more money into them to improve their efficiency or to deliver certain outcomes? These are all AI modeling kinds of questions. But before you get there, you got to have the data. You got to have all the rest of the stuff in place. Otherwise, you're never getting there. Exactly. You can't have AI without data. And where you've got data, you've got AI. And I think, I think we sometimes kind of think AI is this kind of weird kind of ethereal thing. And it, it's not. It's like we're humans. We've got a certain amount of cognitive capability and we can't process all the data we simply can't so we've invented computers that can help us process the data and we happen to call it artificial intelligence but underneath it is models and algorithms and they help us with different analytics patterns like the one that Jeff just described around predictive analytics where we can ask the data algorithms and it uses things like random forest or whatever and tell us like what the likely outcome is for the question that we're asking so where there's data, there's AI, but VSM isn't about AI, but you can augment what we're doing in VSM like you can with any data using algorithms. Well, let, let's turn our conversation to metrics. There's a question that was asked earlier on and I asked the, the participants that we'll, that we'll get to. We have a whole uh, topic around that and did some kind of research. And it, obviously, benchmarking is sort of one question that organizations like are we doing the right set of things? How do we compare to others? Or, or how do we create the metrics? Should we be using external ones? Do we create internal ones? What are the right ones to do? How do we know? And so we asked, you know, what do you use as your guidance to determine KPIs and metrics for value stream management? Obviously, these are not just one set, and they may be uh, very specific to an organization. So you know, by, by far and away, internally developed metrics and KPIs, meaning there isn't one standard that everybody says it's the door metric. So that's what we all do. You know, it's that. Uh, so there's quite a bit of variation, but it, it also looking at what our value stream management and, and technology providers, DevOps, vendors, et cetera, they're looking to the technology community for guidance on what some of those uh, metrics. And then of course, organizationally, you know, value stream management, flow, flow framework, you know, SAFE, DORA. There's a number of sources that I, the way I interpret this is that they're pulling from to uh, maybe create that mix of internally developed and, and some external metrics. Uh, I, I appreciate your reaction to this, Helen. And also, are there some guidance you can give people on how to, how to decide what your metrics should be? This is a, it's a really complex topic because I think the, the answers to this show, uh, yeah. So um, the DORA metrics, obviously the DevOps research and assessment metrics, the four metrics, two for throughput and two for stability. So deployment frequency, lead time, but defined as from code commit to production and stability as MTTR and change fail rate. Um, 
very popular in the DevOps industry. And I picked on lead time because that definition is quite important because we talked about earlier on DevOps tool chains and whether they're CI, CD or whether they go end to end. And that particular lead time definition starts at code commit. So it skips all of what we call the fuzzy front end, the ideation phase. That's not a criticism of the people that put those metrics together. If you read Accelerate, the book that explains the entire data science behind the state of DevOps reports, that was a very conscious choice because that has traditionally been very, very hard to measure. But time has moved on and we have more capability in our portfolio management and product backlog tools and more connection between our tools, thanks to things like VSM than we've ever had before. But I'm dwelling on lead time and cycle time because these are the two big ones. And Jeff said this quite earlier on. These are the big ones, really, when we're talking about value stream management. What gets really complicated is that everyone defines them differently. This is another bit of micro research that we did last year. Our hypothesis was that the market was split on definitions between lead and cycle time. Um, and we discovered that was true. And there's a whole multitude. So um, it really depends what practitioner you talk to and also sometimes what their background is. So a lean practitioner, for example, will not um, not accept the DORA definition of lead time from code commit. That's just not in the kind of lean canon of working because of the fuzzy front end stuff that we just talked about. Um, what we're trying to do with Value Stream Management Consortium is come up with like an end to end definition sort of as a as an open standard and then a way of slicing it up because what we can do when we think about value stream management is actually change our start and stop point. So your start point could be the time that we recorded that we had an idea and your stop point could be we actioned an insight that we had from customer feedback. But there's a number of different places. So I talked about code commit, but you could also measure from the time something got into the sprint backlog. You could measure it at the point that it got through all of your CI tests and was ready to um, go into the deployment pipeline. So what VSM enables us to do is measure all of those different points and really see from, from different start and stop points where the delays are and where the bottlenecks are. Um, those are flow metrics, right? And there's, we've got the flow framework there, which is kind of proprietary because it kind of comes from a vendor. It's kind of linked to a book. We've got the scaled agile framework KPI. It's kind of proprietary, kind of comes from a, from a framework vendor, but they're all really to do with flow and efficiency. Um, one of the other things we're really interested in is the value realization, and this is about customer experience. So being able to measure whether the customer got what we wanted them to get. And that's most people, according to our research at the VSMC, measure those sort of metrics using things like profit, margin, revenue, and sales, which are not actually customer experience metrics. They're business metrics that tell us the lagging, the lagging indicators of the story of what's going on with the customer. But again, as we increase our technological capability, we increase our capability to use things like bounce rate, um, churn, customer journey time, conversion rates on forms, all of these kind of things can tell us much more quickly what the customer experience um, looks like. And I think, Jeff, this is something we talk about quite a lot and a lot of the VSM industry forgets about the value realization area. Yeah, well, I, my background with this question, I first, I go back to a, a, a time when I was on a sales call, um, you know, as a marketing guy, I, you know, I'd listen to some of these and, and uh, the first question he asked was actually around door metrics and deployment frequency. And he basically had a mandate from his boss to say, okay, um, I must increase my deployment frequency. And it was like, great. Why? And, and didn't have, you know, I, that was just what I was told. So, you know, no reason. What I, I smile as I look at these metrics because so quickly we want to jump and run to metrics mm -hmm. and say, oh, this is it. And, and, and then we can get into our religious war over, you know, is it this framework? Is it this definition? Is it, forget about all that. One of the things I love about the VSMC is that there's an implementation roadmap, which is kind of a begin with the end in mind kind of way of figure out where you're going first, because the metrics are critical in helping you determine if you're on that path. If it's value realization, okay. If it's efficiency, okay. But then you have to kind of map it all out. Second point I'll make is uh, one of my favorite quotes is another Peter Drucker one is there's, I'll see if I get this right. There's nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. It's <laughs> great that you're focused on improving efficiency and effectiveness, but 
should you really be doing that? You know, are there are there nuances? Is there more to get automated? Is there, you know, have that as part of the evaluation of what you're doing. And then look at your metrics that will help get you on this journey. Um, I, I would heavily recommend before you get to metrics, understand um, the goal, you know, understand the the points behind the metrics and really some of the lean practices that are, are being talked about here. It will require you to be somewhat of a, of an expert in a lot of metrics, but then you'll understand the thinking behind it. And then you'll decide for yourself which ones make the most sense. In dumbest terms, I still think that um, looking at, you know, I, I hate to put it in these terms, but I, for me, it makes sense because if somebody were explaining it like this to me, it's like, well, how much crap do you put through that pipe for a particular team? You know, however you measure that, you know, how, how long does it take you to get it done? You know, okay, I can be cool and throw lean words on that, like lead time throughput. How how much time do I spend working on stuff versus not? And how much rest of the time is it stuck in handoffs? Okay, but we can measure that stuff. And that is interesting. But start there. Get really, really uh, delved into, you know, the goal, the implementation roadmap, getting rid of the, the things that you shouldn't optimize. It just need to go away. And then look at the final metrics is my response. Yeah, I think another another way of saying what you parts of what you both have said is is if you go for the metrics first, you may identify something you're going to measure, but you know you won't know what or why influences that number or that metric, right? So what are we doing that actually improves that, and what are what are the things in there that we want to bottlenecks, efficiencies, whatever it might be? So it's really easy to get caught in that metrics trap. Uh, I, I agree with you; it, it can become a thing in and of itself. But I think data-driven organizations are seeking for some way to know, uh, are we getting what we're paying for? And that's kind of the whole intent of value stream management. So I love the, love the roadmap idea, too, from the BSM consortium. So that's a great idea. Check that out. Um, let's, let's take a look at um, value stream management integrated with your DevOps tool chain and management tools. You know, we primarily use tools and manually and manual processes outside of DevOps. The largest group responded tools we use provide limited support, but uh, don't fulfill our value stream management needs. And 23% and said the tools we use directly support our, our alignment of work and our value stream management objectives. So a real mix, um, but kind of leaning a little bit more between the, those two on the top and bottom right to the tools we're using are helping us, but, but there's still gaps. There's room to go. We've got, we've got room to improve. Uh, Jeff, as a, as a product person, as a marketing guy, I, I imagine this is a big conversation that you have both internally as well as with, uh, with your customers. It, it is because in order to really get good here, um, you have to bring in data, you know, from, and, and, from across not just DevOps tools, but from agile and planning tools. Um, a lot of the DevOps tools are very, you know, precise. And a lot of the agile tools are, you know, I moved a ticket from this stage to this stage. Um, and so I would call that, you know, maybe it's not as precise, but you're, you're still looking at manual work and trying to um, bring it all together um, uh, with the tool chain you have. Oftentimes the planning tools are not the same as the DevOps tools. And so trying to bring it all together is, is a hard challenge. Um, it, it actually is an area where, again, I love where I work. I feel like I sit in this really unique spot of saying, I don't care where the data comes from. I don't care what your tool chain includes because given open tool chain from Atlassian, you can plug that data in. And because of Jira Align's overlay layer on top of or whatever your planning tools are, uh, we can pull that data in and um, uh, help bring this data together and, and normalize it um, and, and bring it together really in a way that no one else can. Um, this is not a, an easy, you know, a, a, an easy problem to solve. I mean, this is um, not just a tooling problem, but it's a culture problem depending upon how the organization exists. Right. Um, if you're heavy SRE, if you're heavy planning, if you're I mean, there's there's a lot that's wrapped up into this simple question. But um, anyways, it, 
this is as to be expected from what I would have anticipated. Uh, I'm not surprised by the responses here, in other words. You know, it's easy to kind of think we're all automating everything and on this journey and making lots of progress. Not everybody is there, right? A lot of organizations are still working to automate more of their you know, software workflows and pipelines. Helen, someone someone mentioned, well, what do you do if 80% of your work is manual and it's not automated? How do you tie that into getting data and, and producing information that's valuable? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to answer that um, comment without understanding more about the type of value stream that we're working with. But if it was a digital value stream and it was 80% manual, um, I'd certainly be looking for opportunities for automation um, within that, whether it's testing or infrastructure or whatever. And exactly, as participant 496 has just asked participant 262 exactly the question. That's definitely a consulting opportunity um, mm -hmm. for someone in there. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, we can figure out the code of who that, what that number is translated to. <laughs> we have some well, anonymity. <laughs> and there's a lot of this stuff that, you know, may not ever really get automated until our AI capabilities get better. You know, where is the side of design as it fits into this or the feature design or uh, what functionality, the, the customer feedback on, on the design itself? Um, maybe there's threat modeling that's happening before it actually gets to code or the feature trade-off, the investment side of, okay, here's the stuff we're going to do. The balancing of debt versus, you know, defect versus risk um, and those features that come in. There's some balancing that goes on there that requires work that's probably not automated. I put that more on the, on the agile side of the bucket because then once it gets to the dev team, you know, great, let's celebrate how agile we are. Um, and then we can work on getting that to the production as quickly as possible. But a lot of the work that is going on, in fact, that fuzzy front end oftentimes is far greater, if not orders of magnitude greater than the actual dev work it takes to build and get it to production. Mm -hmm. We're really going to get better. We've got to have visibility into all work. You know, there's another uh, unfortunate consequence to the you build it, you run it, you know, you own it kind of mentality is that, you know, the dev team now, they're area and domain of responsibility just exploded. Um, just on a, a couple of weeks ago with a customer talking about, gosh, developers are feeling like they can't get anything done anymore. Um, how do we make that visible? Well, here you go. This is the answer. How can we partition off so that the right people are doing the right things and, and see where the inefficiencies lie? And again, let's not get efficient with things that shouldn't be done. We're getting some great questions into people asking about case studies and uh, kind of business, you know, business case that you can make in your organization. And uh, Helen, if you would post your uh, case studies, if you'd post that in the general chat, I'd love for folks to get access to that. BSNC. Sure. So this is the Valley Stream Management Foundation course from the consortium and every module has a case study. So there's at least eight and there's more in the back as well. And then there was recently an event with, a, I apologize, with another analyst, IDC, um, and this features Netflix, Shutterstock, Comcast Business and Defense Unicorns. Oh, sorry, I've just put the same link in twice. I do. What did I? Nope, I no problem. That? Nope, they're both different. Good. Um, yeah, so first one's course, second one's uh, a webinar. Very good. Well, let's jump to that. What are, what are organizations seeing from their efforts uh, so far, of course, everyone is a different place, you know, in their in their journey in, in uh, implementing their value stream management strategies. You know, we, we had the, by far the we've seen some tangible improvements there in that kind of adoption phase of rolling this out. It's it's not at the uh, you know, we're, we're at the, a, a good steady state still in the process of of delivering results through value stream management. And, and, and still some 15% said that they've seen significant and tangible improvements as a result of doing this, which it puts you, you know, up in that 50% category. Um, but, you know, some folks are still early, either not doing it a few, but a number of folks have uh, none yet, but they're anticipating getting it. Is that pretty consistent, Jeff, with where you see customers and prospects and people that are looking for, results from VSM? Um, yeah, I, I think I've seen more 
tangible results than this. So that's surprising. Uh, it's hard to put a price tag on the number of when a team goes and implements and creates the cool dashboard and the executive looks at it and goes, ooh, that's nifty. <laughs> so, um, has that really improved the efficiency of the team? No, but you know what? It's really sexy and um, very cool. Um, are they, I think the journey of implementing and the journey of laying things out so you can actually evaluate the efficiency has a massive improvement just in itself. And then it draws a baseline where uh, justification can be poured to making continuous improvement. Um, but I, I've heard a, a number of stories of, of improvements that have been made. And so um, I, I think I would probably say, you know, it. I probably have seen a, more on the tangible uh, improvement than, than what's represented here. Well, in, in pointing that out too, people responding to this are a wide population uh, from somebody that I'm, le I'm learning in the very beginning to I'm doing this, right? And I would imagine uh, conversations you're engaged in or maybe people that are more co concentrating on this and engaged with it, uh, given, given the technology company that you are. Uh, Helen that responded to uh, one of our participants and it was a point you were also making, Jeff, is just that visibility, you know, illuminating what's happening, exposing it and having the conversation and understanding what's going on. Half the time, it seems like we're, we're making changes, changes to a system we don't really understand, but making that visible is probably half the value of yeah. going down this path. Yeah, yeah well, I'll, since I'm already talking, okay, jump right in. <laughs> um, you know that is the point of of Jira line. You know, it's not Jira; it's a management layer on top of Jira's, and and other planning tools to do exactly that: give visibility, align the data, align the initiatives to what's happening, provide an executive layer that you can influence. You know, both that the bottom up can match with what's coming from a top down perspective so that uh, we can manage this journey, which is why it's such a great natural uh, fit for value stream management um, when we add in our data mart and some of the other tools that we have there. Um, it, it's all a value add to provide insights and visibility and transparency into the software delivery factory. Will teams see improvement of this? Yes. Most importantly, back to the point of, you know, not doing the wrong thing, you'll see some things where um, gosh, we shouldn't be working on that. <laughs> you know, that, that whole pipeline, throw it away. It's not worth the time. You know, we're not going to get the, the value results out of it. So why improve it? Um, mm -hmm. Now let's go redouble our efforts and focus on areas that we should improve. That's the point of what we're trying to put together here. Helen, um, we're coming up on the end of our time. Love to get your reactions to this or any other comments you want to make before we turn it back over. Yeah, I mean, just kind of takeaways from the last few minutes of what you guys have been saying. I keep on banging on about digital value streams being different. And one of the reasons is they're invisible. Software is largely invisible. We build front ends to it, but it's not like walking into a factory and seeing all the parts and bits on conveyor belts and being put together. So this is why it's so important to make this work visible, why VSM is so important. This particular piece of data here, and um, we talked about this a bit sort of as you were preparing the report, and it's a bit of a bell curve. And actually at the Value Stream Management Consortium last year in 2022, we were very strong on the theme of crossing the chasm, which is another bell curve in terms of technology adoption. So we do believe that we are in probably the early adopter phase, like um, Jeff. Uh, this is you can interpret this slides in a bit glass empty half empty glass half full and mm -hmm. your glass half empty says oh only 15 percent seeing improvement or your glass half full is actually it's 57 percent of people exactly. are seeing some sort of improvement so it's you know if you average that that's probably about the reality mm -hmm. no definitely. one's seeing none i don't know if you asked none whether that was in the question <laughs> Well, definitely the front of the wave, right? I mean, you've, yeah. you're, 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 you've crested that bell curve and pushed it, pushed it forward. So some fantastic results. We, we've talked about downloading the report. Everybody can get a, a get a hold of it by in the handout section or just sit back. We will email this to you along with the slides, along with uh, a, a recording of the webinar. Um, Jeff, before we hand it over to Cody, any parting thoughts you'd like to share with folks? Um, well, just, hey, there is a marketing guy in me. We offer tools. I recognize that the whole planet seems to offer value stream management um, now and with varying definitions. But I can tell you as an Atlassian vendor, 
um, you know, don't try to struggle with this on your own. Um, we have tooling for it. We can help you in the journey. Um, we're partnered with the largest, most comprehensive um, uh, channel partners on the planet. Um, we have anybody and everybody that you need to take this on and, and help improve your software delivery, making work visible and aligned to executives the way no one else can. Um, that's my two cents. Fantastic. Can I just say one quick Jump thing? Right in, Helm. Um, there is a question in the chat about the URL for business cases. Um, Jeff, there is the Forrester Total Economic Impact Report, the Jira Align. Have we got time to grab a link for that? I can try. I'll make sure we'll take all those links that okay. here and that one, and we'll put it in the email, Helen, so everybody Perfect. gets it. These are things referenced during. I mean, talk about a wealth of information, this research, and so much more. So I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, so we'll handle it that way while you're while you're pulling that uh, that link out. I want to thank everybody uh, for attending today. This has been wonderful. I especially want to thank Atlassian and and Helen from the Bag Stream Management Consortium. It's been a great partnership working together on this research, research and kind of eliciting some data to build on work that, that others have done and also going to share some new information as well. So thank you to you, Jeff, and everyone at the Alassian crew. Great organization there. With that, I'm going to turn back into Cody to, uh, to do the wrap up and, and handoff and we'll be done. Awesome. Thank you, Mitch. And Helen, Jeff, thank you both for joining us back on Tech Strong Learning. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty. Thanks, everybody, for coming today. We will see you again soon. Check out Atlassian.com for sure and the Value Stream Management Consortium. So uh, this session was recorded. You will be receiving it via email shortly after we conclude. You will also be receiving, or you can also access it on devops.com slash webinars, and be sure to look in the on-demand section. It will be there waiting. The four winners of our $25 Amazon gift card giveaway are Irene M, Derry R, Swapnil B, and Owen C. So to our four winners, keep an eye on your inbox to claim that gift card. It should make its way over to you in about the next 48 hours. If you don't happen to see it, just check your spam folder in case it gets filtered out. I'd like to thank Atlassian for sponsoring our program today. I'd like to thank TechStrong Research for providing the insights for our Pulse Meter report. And to our audience, thank you so much for being with us for the past hour. We really value your time and we want to hear your thoughts. So there will be a survey that pops up as soon as we close out. Let us know what you thought about our program today or perhaps what you'd like to see on an upcoming program. Regardless, we do hope to see everyone at a future Tech Strong Learning experience. Have a great rest of your day and Helen, Jeff, Mitch, thank you all once more. Thank you. Thank you.